This is a response to Nephilim Free's video, Ow Chihuahua Frankenscience Part 1. My apologies for intruding on this exchange, Neff, but some of the things you said were just so outrageous that I felt obliged to stick my oar in. I've always <laughs> stated that morphology is form and structure, because that's what it is, and that we don't see morphological change. Morphology in biology is the form and structure of plants and animals. How is that vague? That's not vague. Now notice the and in there. See, it's real important. Because shape alone is not morphological. Shape alone is not morphology without structure, you see. But now see what you're going to try to do in this video. Is you're going to try to redefine morphology so that form alone can be considered morphology. So that a change to the shape of a creature can be considered a morphological change. So you can claim evolution has taken place. You want us to believe that form alone can be morphology, but it's not. See, science states that morphology is, let's read it again, boys and girls, form and structure. The banality of this argument simply beggars belief. So let's take a closer look at what you're trying to do. Science provides evidence to support the premise that evolution results in a change in organism morphology over time, and then you proceed to say, No, you goon! Morphology isn't what you say it is, it's this other thing. So your evidence doesn't show a change in morphology at all, you see? Evolution's a false religion. It kind of feels like a little kid in third grade shouting, Look over there! And then pulling the old switcheroo. Only greasier. It may have worked for you in the playground, Neff, but you're gonna have to do a lot better now you're dealing with grown-ups. For the record, the reason that morphology isn't defined by shape alone is because two organisms can be visually very similar and yet differ significantly in their underlying structure. In the case of closely related organisms and in the absence of molecular methods of analysis, early zoologists and botanists realized the importance of dissection when comparing organisms. Morphology is therefore the totality of the combined description of the external shape and underlying structure, so a change in morphology is any difference in this totality. This is a perfect example of why reading something on the internet does not equate to obtaining a formal education. If you'd taken a course on comparative zoology or anatomy instead of spending two minutes on dictionary.com and pouncing on the word and as if it were the last choir boy at a Catholic bishop's convention, you might have learnt this. But then again, you may know it anyway and are just content with lying your face off. So does the facile and simplistic definition from an insincere weirdo with an agenda deserve equal respect to the one used by tens of thousands of scientists today? You know what? I'm feeling generous, so let's use yours. Instead, I can create a new word, how about nephedictic, and define it as I did earlier. Now, I can provide you with the exact same data and show that evolution results in a change in organism nephedicticity over time. How do you answer that one, Neff? Will you redefine my new word? Because I can just pick another. Maybe nephtodology. All you're doing here is playing pathetic word games to avoid addressing the real and insurmountable evidence that you are completely incapable of refuting honestly. Now as for dogs and morphology, there is no change to morphology between any two breeds of dog, regardless of what the breed. Change to shape, yes. But again, morphology is form and structure. See, not just form. See, you're trying to get around that. You're trying to get around that. All dogs have the same morphological features in the same location in their body plan. They have the same morphology. Once again, just because one delusionary nutjob decides to redefine the meaning of a word that the rest of the world has been using doesn't mean that the definition has actually changed anywhere except in the hallucination that for him passes as reality. What I've said is that the homeobox genes cannot be changed in such a way that morphological change is the result. If homeobox genes cannot be changed such that morphological change is the result, then how the hell did we find them? New genes are routinely discovered from the effect of spontaneous mutation on organism morphology or physiology, and conversely, new gene functions are identified by mutating them and observing their phenotypic effects. Your statement simply serves to showcase the breadth and magnitude of your ignorance. For example, here's a paper I picked up after the most cursory of searches showing the discovery of a new homeobox mutation in wasps. If these genes can't be changed, Neff, then why the fuck does this insect have a leg sticking out of its head? There is not one instance known in millions of genetic experiments 
thousands of which are conducted every single day all across the world in universities. Not one reported instance of a morphological change that has become permanent in a species due to random genetic mutation. You do realize that genetic experiments are usually conducted in laboratories, don't you, Neff? So how is it that you can even remotely think that it would be possible to globally introduce a mutation permanently into a species from the confines of a single room? Let alone that I'm willing to bet a million bucks on saying that this has never been the goal of a single genetic experiment, let alone that there are actual laws and regulations in place to stop this from happening accidentally, and let alone the concerns and precautions taken to prevent the spread of DNA from genetically modified crops. If this is what passes for an argument inside your head, then I've got a bridge I'd like to sell you. To rebut the claim that morphological change has not been observed, I could simply point out that the changes between dogs, which Nephilim Free accepts, is referred to by the scientific community as a morphological change. The link you provided doesn't show up. It may have existed, it's not there anymore. But no, uh, the scientific community does not consider dogs to be evolutionary I mean, morphological change. Evolutionary, yes, but not morphological, no. So why is it then, Neff, that when I input the exact same Earl into Firefox, I got this? Funny, that. So either your typing is as bad as your apologetics, or you're just a bald cunt, I mean, bald-faced liar. And isn't it strange that that's all it takes for you to completely dismiss this point and go on to assert unequivocally and without citing any sources that the scientific community does not consider physical changes between dog breeds to be morphological? Considering that you certainly aren't a member of that community, don't you think you're being a little presumptuous to be speaking on its behalf? If you had any interest in the truth, you might even have gone as far as to type dog's morphological change into PubMed and scan the results for a minute or two to find a number of peer-reviewed scientific papers discussing morphological changes between dog breeds. But then, you aren't interested in the truth, are you, Neff? Seventy years, millions of experiments. I think we've qualified this through the scientific method, don't you? By experimentation, we need to go back from, you know, the point in the scientific uh, method where the results do not support the hypothesis. We go back and discard the hypothesis, you see. But evolutionists won't do that. Evolution must be true! See, so, forget the 70 years of mutation experimentation. That doesn't mean nothing. See, that's how evolutionists think. See, doesn't matter them. The paradigm is true. It's gotta be true. Evolution's true. Gotta be true. Evolution's true. Thank you for that demonstration of your somewhat unconventional masturbatory technique. But I digress. Apart from your attempt to discredit evolutionary biology with your facile genetic mutation experiments argument, what I found funny in this clip was your use of the word we when referring to scientific research and the scientific method. When was the last time you were in a lab, Nev? How many actual experiments have you conducted? Published many papers lately? It's hard to comprehend the magnitude of the arrogance it takes for you to sit there pontificating about how science should be done and then expect to be taken seriously when you have no formal training and have shown yourself time and time again to be either grossly or willfully ignorant or simply supremely stupid. So why don't you go and get yourself a real science degree, Neff? Then come back in a few years and maybe you'll have some credibility. In the meantime, you'll just remain a sad little man with an ego the size of a planet and an intellect the size of a pea. Let's take a look at a little more of your astounding superciliousness. I've noticed a lot of evolutionists, laypersons like yourself, trying to do that in the last year or so, too. And you've just lost the game, kid, by trying to redefine science. You see, I've said it many times, evolutionists are not scientific. Evolutionism is not science, said before. Evolutionism is an attempt to mold science to fit their paradigm, the worldview that life was not created by God. Yes, I squished Dr. Mark A. McPeak like I'm squishing you. Once again, Neff, your alleged two years of research on the Google machine does not substitute for your utter lack of scientific education and does not make you an expert on anything any more than spending two years drooling over internet porn would make you a super stud. You're as qualified to opine on the nature of science as a nun is to discuss the Kama Sutra. Also, I'm curious, do you actually have any evidence of this alleged squishing? If not, I suspect that it's simply another God-fueled hallucination that's swirling around between your earphones. 
So they have to try, they try to get around that by redefining everything. That's what evolution is too. They're like they redefine evolution itself. You see, before the discovery of DNA and the, the recipe for the design, morphological design of a creature was discovered, you know what evolutionists claimed? They claimed that, that organisms adapted to their environment and this caused morphological change. Here we go with another tired old creationist chestnut. Science is always changing its mind so it can't be trusted. Has it ever entered that small shriveled cluster of neurons inside your head that the strength of science is its requirement to modify theory in the light of new evidence? I'm personally growing sick of pointing out to creationists that this is why science has allowed us to progress while blind acceptance of supernatural explanations and religious dogma leads solely to stagnation. Lamarckism was an early attempt to explain the observed facts that showed that organisms changed from the past to present, and even though it was incorrect, it was still a better explanation than the one you prefer. It was quickly rejected following Darwin's proposal of natural selection and buried after the acceptance of Mendelian genetics and replaced with better explanations that fit the data more accurately. Nevertheless, Lamarckism was an important stepping stone on the road to knowledge because it encouraged people to question and to think and to search for better explanations. So aside from being a phenomenally weak and puerile argument, it is disingenuous of you in the extreme to apply that because it was incorrect that modern evolutionary theory must also be wrong. There are no bones, no fossils of whales with bones appearing. And then that same bone is longer. And then that same bone is longer. And then that same bone is longer. Then it's protruding from the, the rear of the, of the animal. Then it's protruding and further. And then we have, we have a fin. See, you need a series like that. No series of where we can say one, two, three, four, and five. And look at them and see the morphological change take place. But really, to be honest with you, you'd need 20, at least. Despite the richness of the fossil record, you are never satisfied, are you, Neff? You set impossible standards for evidence despite blindly accepting your own beliefs with none at all, and then pompously sit there and declare that it's still not enough as more and more transitions are discovered. It's all so easy for you, isn't it, Neff? Certainly easier than thinking up a good argument. No matter how many transitional forms are presented to you, it'll never be enough. In fact, I find it quite amusing to see that you almost painted yourself into a corner when you suggested that 20 might be enough, and then you didn't even have the balls not to caveat it with at least. Where did you pick that number from, by the way? Just curious. What you're doing is taking two creatures of different kinds and placing them together. Just like an evolutionist would argue that, you know, a, a creationist takes, uh, claims that all cats are the same kind. No, we don't claim that. God created more than one kind of cat. A house cat is clearly not of the same kind as a lion. Okay? So you place them next to each other and boy, they look a lot alike, don't they? Structurally, they are very alike, right? But they are different kinds. A dragonfly and a damselfly are two different kind. So Neff, riddle me this. Why is it that you claim that dogs show no change in morphology because they all have the same number of bones, tendons, muscles, organs and joints in the same locations of their body and are therefore the same kind, and yet you can say exactly the same thing about a cat and a lion, but you claim that they're different kinds? Is it because dogs can interbreed and house cats and lions can't? Because it almost sounds as if you're saying that kind means species. But you won't accept that, will you? Because you know that it'll destroy the creationist claim that we've never seen one kind of animal evolve into another kind, because as soon as you define kind as a species, then you'll have to explain all the extant speciation events that have been documented. So, if a kind is not a species, then is there any chance of you giving us a clear and concise definition? Because I've never heard one. What criteria do you use to make these distinctions, Neff? And why do you expect us to accept them as fact? Are you going on gut feel? Or are you just making them up as you go in whichever way best suits the limp argument you happen to be making at the time? Or maybe you have a direct line to your God. Does he whisper these things in your ear while you're spooning at the end of a long and tiring day of talking crap? You're so lucky to be the chosen one, Neff. You really are. Because no matter how much we laugh at you, no matter how much of a liar and an idiot you make yourself out to be, at least you have the safety of your infantile and ludicrous delusions to comfort you. Because in the real world, that's all they're good for.